Let's just double click on a GTP to open it. And like I mentioned, you can apply any filtering you'd like, change the type of extraction, whether it be a full extraction, so everything in this particular data source, or just a delta. So whatever changed recently, you wanna pull that in instead of bringing everything. You can set the type of update process. So where you want it to be updating to, InfoCube, DSO. Obviously we just want this to go to the InfoCube. And then the execution. So how we want this DTP to run, the type of processing mode, whether it be parallel or serial, you can specify that here. And when you're ready to run your DTP, you simply press execute. And that triggers the transformation to kick off and pull that data from its source and push it up after applying and massaging that data, all the logic up to the info cube. And that in a nutshell is the ETL process for BW. So in BW, we have two primary info object types, characteristic and key figure. In this picture here, you can see a characteristic info object configuration screen. So here you can define how you want to describe this object, what kind of description, the character type, whether it be a, a car, numc, a date or a time. And the characteristic only stores numbers and letters, length one to 60. The number can only store numbers, obviously, and its length is one to 60. Dates, just store dates, and time. And you don't calculate key performance indicators or KPIs with characteristics. You simply use your characteristics to describe your KPI results. So things you're calculating, which are key figures. So a key figure is something like sales, something that you wanna see over time, something that you could average. Obviously you can't average like a cost center. It wouldn't make any sense. It just describes something that you're trying to calculate. So key figure. And you have different data types here, amount, number, date, quantity, integer, time, so for our data type, for amount, normally we're gonna be using currency and you're able to specify the type of currency. So what region of the world you're in and SAP is smart enough to look up what the exchange value is and actually transforms that into what the current value is for that day. So you can have it look, at, look up against a global table and apply the transformation logic to convert that currency. So let's look at a characteristic and key figure info object. If you click on the info objects, we can see that there's a few catalogs here that we can choose from. So let's just open up one of these characteristic catalogs. And we'll open up this organizational unit characteristic. And you can see that the technical name starts with a zero which means it was delivered by SAP. So this came pre-installed. If you wanna make your own custom objects, you can start it with a Z, like down here, which I highly recommend. It's a best practice to differentiate yourself from SAP objects. So this is called the namespace. So SAP reserves the zero namespace for their objects. You, cre you can't create a zero object if you try to, unless you hacked the system or gave yourself crazy access. You really shouldn't be toying around with a zero namespace. Keep it with, stick with Z. So we'll open up this organizational unit and we see that this data type is a number. So you can choose from characteristic, number, date, or time. Obviously this being an org unit, it's going to be a series of numbers. The max you could choose is 60 for this. Obviously they've already chosen eight because they know that their data coming in from the source is only a length of eight. This is very important because if you ever have a length of 10, for instance, coming in from your, your source, it's not going to fit. So it's very important to make sure you match up the lengths or at least have more space allocated on the BW side. If you're loading a length of four, BW will automatically pad that with zeros to meet this eight length. On our next tab here, we have Business Explorer. This is basically telling us we can hard code 
particular settings for this object. So when we go to the front end, instead of displaying key, it can display text or key and text. And after you take the BW305 training, this will make more sense because it's easier to hard code it here and have it display automatically on the front end with a particular setting. Or if you prefer to make it all the adjustments on the front end, you can do that as well. Next, we have our master data and texts. We can see that we do have master data assigned to this object because this is lit up in green. So when someone creates an object, a custom object, they would have to check this box up here with master data. And if they wanted to also associate texts, they can check the text button here. And what that's gonna do is create a few system tables. Over here, we have the master data tables that were created, and then our text table. So if you drill into these by clicking into them, you can see the structure of this particular org unit, master data view. Click on this to display the data, run this. And for this particular org unit, we have a date to date from assigned. So not much valuable information is visible here, but you get the idea. And in the actual training, we walk through a ton of different master data tables. So you'll get a pretty good idea and feel of how that all intermingles. You can set up hierarchies. Your attributes for this particular object. And we walk through all that in the training as well. And compounding. If you want to have two info objects combined together to form a more unique data set, you can do that as well. So let's now take a look at the key figure objects. So we'll open up this key figure catalog and launch this absolute sales and cost value. And we can see here that this is defined as an amount because it's sales. It's a data type currency, which is being stored as a decimal. And it's using a local currency unit. If we double click into this, we can see that that also has its own settings. And SAP is responsible for these because they've delivered it. We can choose how we want this to be aggregated, whether it be a sum, a max, a min. If there's any exceptions within the aggregation, we would define that here. And whether or not the value is cumulative. So if you're if you have inventory as one of your key figure objects, you obviously wouldn't want that to be cumulative because it changes from day to day. You wouldn't be adding it up together. And then additional properties. These ones have to do with the front end like we saw with the characteristic for the Business Explorer setting. Same sort of deal here where you can define how many decimal places you want displayed on the front end. Descriptions. And that's the key figure info object back out. And now let's take a look at master data. So I spoke a little bit about master data, but what is it and what is it not? So characteristic info objects can be configured to contain this thing called master data. Master data is shared across the environment. And a few examples are colors, sizes, net weight, and gender. So what you may have noticed about these different examples are that it could be shared easily. Many items can have the same weight. There's only a, a certain number of colors out there, certain sizes. So if you're selling clothes, you have small, medium, large, extra large. Master data puts all of those particular values in a SID table. And that table is then read whenever anything calls for that particular color or size. So it's reading from one table versus having it dispersed throughout the entire environment. And this allows for one single version of truth and optimizes read performance because BW only needs to read from one table to get this information rather than doing joins or looking at multiple tables for this kind of data. It's all in one area. And what's not ideal for master data? Something that's not shared, something that's unique, like a phone number or a social security number, or a date. These are things you can't easily repeat. So here's a graphic of master data 
being used inside of InfoCubes. And these blue and red circles signify InfoCubes. InfoCubes are made up of fact tables, dimension tables, and SID tables. The fact table contains the facts, all of your numbers, your amounts, your values, and you won't find any, any text inside of this fact table. It's just gonna be like transaction 0007, date, time, amount, that sort of thing. And then you're gonna have dimensions which tie to certain things. So if we have a product dimension, for instance, over here, and then a customer dimension over here, those would have dimension IDs inside of the fact table. And each of those dimension IDs tie back to a SID table ID. So the SID table is the one that contains, for example, like a color. So if this transaction is someone buying a red shirt for a certain dollar amount, so customer 05, we go to this dimension table, we know this, we go to the SID table, and we know this customer's name is Mark. And Mark can be shared all over the place. And then we go to this dimension table for the product. So shirt, we go back to this table again and go to this table this time to get the, to get the particular color, red. And then we could have even more descriptions textually for that particular color, autumn red, burnt red. You know, you, you can have all sorts of different things inside of there. Everything you see here, the fact table and dimension tables, they're not storing any real text unless they're set up to be that way, which you can do in a line item dimension. We talk about that a little more in the actual training course, but the SID tables are this surrogate ID table, which contains all of the real low level data that's shared throughout the entire BW environment. So like we can see that this blue info cube and this red info cube both share this same SID table because these two dimension tables have values that they care about in this SID table. Now let's take a look in the BW environment to show you a live demonstration of a SID table. And this is just a demonstration cube, so I'll right click, display data. And what it's showing me now is the different dimensions that have been configured in this info cube. And you'll see more of how to set all these up in the actual training. But we have two different fields here for customer the customer ID and the customer ID SID, or the surrogate ID. Let's run this, selecting all of our different cells to display in our report, our two key figures, amount and sales quantity. Now we'll hit run. Run again. And if we scroll down here, we can see customer 010 has four transactions, but the customer SID is defined as 11 and it's repeated multiple times. So it's not 11, 12, 13, 14. SAP only stores customer 010 in one table and it assigns it this surrogate ID of 11. So whenever customer 10 is mentioned anywhere in BW using this particular info object, customer ID, it's going to automatically look to that table and quickly reference that this is, hey, SID 11 is assigned to this customer. So let's say customer 10 was actually customer 55. We can change the master data, load that into BW, and then customer 10 becomes customer 55, and all of the, the SIDs will update accordingly. When we run our reports, we don't ever display SIDs though. That's more of a system thing. That's a system-based value we don't care about. We're not gonna be able to actually get any information out of that. It's just tied to the BW system. So if we go back, and I'll select our fields for output, deselecting all, selecting all characteristics, making sure our key figures are checked, and now we won't see any of those SID values when we run this report. So this is how it would look on the front end of BW. But when we ran this, what it actually did was it, it went out to all of the SID tables, pulled these particular textual values and threw them up in this view we're currently looking at. It didn't actually look for customer 001, it looked for the SID for that customer. 
So transformations are pretty complex objects. If you're just doing straight mapping, so however it comes in from the, the source, you're just clicking and attaching the arrow to the target, and you can see this equal sign here means it's just a straight map. Nothing's really changing from source to target. But if you want to actually apply some logic here, you can modify this transformation. Go to rule details. We can see that it's currently a direct assignment, but we can change this to be a ton of different things. A constant, meaning one value, always hard coded to that. A formula, whether it reads from master data, reads from a data source, or through a routine. When you select routine, it's gonna bring up this ABAP, which is SAP's programming language screen that you can customize and custom code so if you don't know ABAP, I wouldn't come into this unless you actually knew what you're doing. But this is where you can really code out and use some formulaic equations to transform your data in a very custom way. But these do tax the processor a little bit. So it does take up some more resources to run this and a little more time to run through versus like a straight map. Close out of this. You can also change the start routine or the end routine. And this is a block of code that you're going to execute before running through any of these mappings down here. So it, it means run this first, then run all of these. And then if you had our end routine, you'd run through that at the end. So start routine, whatever's going on down here, and then the end routine. So if your development required you to have custom code, maybe to do some lookups or something like that, you can do that in the start routine. Let's take a look at data sources in a little bit more detail.